Hey everyone, I'm Ben Norton and this is Geopolitical Economy Report. Usually here I analyze the latest geopolitical and economic developments in the world. And I'm going to be doing that today a bit later. But this is a special episode and today I'm going to be talking about my experience in China. I recently made a huge life change and I moved to China. I have been living in Beijing for a bit over a month. I have not been here a super long time, but I wanted to make a video reflecting on what I have already learned being here several weeks. Now, I'm not changing the direction of this channel. I'm going to continue to do the original reporting and analysis on geopolitics and economics that I've always done here, talking about other regions of the world. This is not going to become a channel where I only make videos about my experience in China and the places I visited. There are already several great channels that do that kind of work. I came here because I wanted to actually understand what China is like on the inside, because the only way to really understand a country is to visit it, and in particular to spend time, not just a few days, not even just a few weeks, to spend a few years living in that country. That's my plan. I also plan on doing a PhD in economics, in particular focused on development economics. I want to learn more about China's economic policies, which have been remarkable. I mean, China has overseen the most incredible economic growth in human history. I'll be talking about that today. It has gone from one of the poorest countries on the planet to lifting more than 800 million people out of poverty. In fact, according to World Bank data, China was responsible for three quarters of all of the world's reduction in extreme poverty since the 1980s. And when you look at the gradual decline in global inequality, inequality between countries, you see that if you remove China, from the data, there is no change. And today, China has the world's largest economy, larger even than the US economy. These are all things that I'm going to be discussing today in further detail. And the first thing that I really wanna to stress today is I think that China could be the most sovereign country on the planet. Now, I will go into much greater detail later today discussing what I mean by that, but it's Really incredible, I mean, when you think about all the propaganda, demonizing China as this horrible authoritarian dystopia where the government wants to control everything, what you actually realize is that this is a country that went through a period of partial colonization, the century of humiliation, as it's known, in which numerous foreign powers invaded and even controlled parts of the country, including Japan, including European countries, including the US. Britain and France invaded China in 1860 and burnt down the Summer Palace. And in fact, you can go visit the Summer Palace here in China and see the ruins of the palace that was burnt down by the European invaders. Then in 1900, China was invaded again by the so-called Eight Nation Alliance, which included the European powers, the US and Japan. They occupied the capital, Beijing. That was just over 100 years ago. And in the span of the thousands of years of Chinese history, that was very recent. So these acts of foreign intervention and attacks and the opium wars and all of these problems are things that very much are in the historical consciousness here in China that people very much remember and don't want to repeat. This has all led China to create a very unique political and economic model. And by the way, Beijing has no interest whatsoever in imposing that model on other countries. And China has prioritized sovereignty, technological sovereignty, economic sovereignty, food sovereignty. These are all things that China has been able to develop in the past several decades in a way that I think no other country on earth has been able to do. So I'll explain this more in detail later, but here's a very brief summary. If you travel to many countries all across the planet, you see that the technology they use is produced by Western corporations, especially US corporations from Silicon Valley. All of the apps they use are from US companies in Silicon Valley. So whether that's for communications, 
not only social media and, and news communication, but also, for instance, email. You know, how many people use Gmail all around the world? These are companies that have close relations with the U.S. government. They are contractors with the U.S. government. Or if you look, for instance, at the, the actual technology that is produced, like cell phones or computers, a lot of this also comes from U.S. companies, many of which are U.S. government contractors. In China, it's not the case. All of the apps that are used in everyday life are sovereign Chinese apps. They don't belong to U.S. corporations on Silicon Valley that work with the Pentagon. Much of the physical technology is also Chinese, whether that's the phones are Chinese, the computers are Chinese, even the cars are increasingly Chinese and other forms of transportation. They can produce all of that locally. They don't rely on foreign firms, and in particular, U.S. corporations that are part of the military industrial complex. If you travel to many countries on Earth, you can see how dependent they are on Silicon Valley, on the U.S., but China is not like that. And not only are those technologies produced by Chinese firms, but every part of the supply chain is located physically in China. China can make sure that those parts of the supply chain are not cut off by foreign countries that might want to destabilize it, like we see now with the growing geopolitical tensions between the U.S. and China. This cannot be said for many other countries, including the U.S., by the way, which is completely dependent on major parts of the supply chain located in other countries, including in China, which has led to discussion of economic decoupling and friend shoring and all of these, these buzzwords that we hear today in economic discussions. But the point is, the, the point I really need to stress that I'll be exploring m in much greater detail later on, is that China is sovereign in a way that I think no other country is sovereign in. And that's not something we think a lot about, it's not very intuitive, especially if you haven't come here and seen the country with your own eyes, but it is so important. And it also helps us to understand Chinese government policy and the Western portrayals of China that, that portray China as trying to control everything and censor everything. When you actually think about it through the lens of sovereignty and trying to defend its national interests against the long history of foreign meddling, you can understand a lot of Chinese policy. China is sovereign in so many ways, not just technologically, not just economically, not just politically. These are all things that I'm going to be exploring today in this analysis. But I also want to talk about why I decided to move here. I think we're in a very tragic and dangerous historical moment in a new Cold War. The United States has taken very aggressive policies against China. Numerous U.S. government officials have made it clear that they want to overthrow the Chinese government, just as the U.S. was involved in overthrowing the Soviet government in 1991 in Russia. Washington and some European capitals have also imposed sanctions on Chinese companies and government officials and different institutions, and this is all leading in a very dangerous direction there are many people warning of the possibility of war. In fact, some U.S. generals are openly saying that they're preparing for waging war on China. This is all tragic because it is totally preventable. It is not necessary. I truly believe in the possibility of promoting peaceful cooperation, mutually beneficial development. These are all things that could be on the table if the U.S. largely, but also some European countries, could abandon this very aggressive policy that seeks to try to contain and weaken and destabilize China. So I think in this moment, it is very important to have people who have an English language audience, who are from the West, to come here to China to see what it, life is actually like on the ground, to be able to see with your own eyes if the Western media is telling the truth about China, because this is really the only way of understanding what a country actually is like, is visiting. And I also want to stress, because of course I'm going to be attacked by critics who always like to re resort to cheap ad hominem attacks, who claim that I'm a propagandist for China or I'm a shill for China, which is ridiculous. Yes, I am living here now, but I have no links whatsoever to the Chinese government. I'm completely independent. I will stress that I am not working for a Chinese media outlet. 
I am not getting paid by the Chinese government. I am completely independent as a journalist. Yes, I do plan on doing a PhD, but I mean, studying in a foreign country doesn't make you a tool of that foreign country's government. There are a lot of people who go to the United States or go to the UK to study, and I wanted to do a PhD in economics, and I didn't want to do it in a Western country precisely because there is so much bias against countries like China and much of the global south. There still is this very kind of colonial perspective. Many programs are very dogmatic. Now, I shouldn't have to say any of this. It's ridiculous that I have to give these kinds of disclaimers, but I mentioned that we're in a very toxic environment of a new Cold War, and anyone who criticizes Western narratives about countries like China or Russia or other global south targets were often demonized and called propagandists and smeared without any evidence and you have these ridiculous ad hominem attacks and it's it's just it does not help you to understand the world all that does is encourages xenophobia and tries to get people in the west to to close their minds off to the rest of the world to see china and other foreign countries as these boogeymen that we need to be afraid of and ultimately the goal tragically is about manufacturing consent for more and more aggressive policies that could lead to war. Of course, war could be catastrophic, and that's why it is so important to speak out against this propaganda and to understand what's actually happening. Being here in China, one of the first things that really strikes you, of course, if you're just visiting, but also if you're living here, is the level of development. Now, I really must stress this fact. China's economic development has no parallel in human history. It is absolutely remarkable. In the 1940s, when China still had a feudal system with an emperor, and it was still partially colonized by foreign powers, the average person only lived until their 30s. It depends on the estimates you look at, but between 32 and 35 years. But if you fast forward to today, China's life expectancy is now 78, which is higher than the life expectancy in the United States, which is only 76. And by the way, the U.S. life expectancy is dropping, whereas China's continues to rise. That's not the only incredible indicator. Another example is simply the size of the economy. GDP consists of the goods and services produced in a given economy. Sometimes it obfuscates more than it clarifies, so I do have some criticisms of it that I'll be talking about in a moment. But GDP is the metric most commonly used by economists, and when you look at the U.S. GDP compared to China, China's economy actually overtook the United States in 2018, and China today has the world's largest economy when you measure its GDP at purchasing power parity, which is the best way to measure the size of an economy, because instead of just converting every all the prices in the economy to dollars, which would be nominal GDP, which doesn't make sense because in a country like China, you don't use dollars, they have their own currency. And as I'll talk about later, China's a currency, the renminbi, is actually very much undervalued. You can buy a lot with very few yuan compared to dollars. So what that really means is if you only convert it to dollars, you don't actually get a real understanding of the size of the economic power of the Chinese economy. If you measure it in purchasing power parity, you can see that actually it is the world's largest economy and continues to grow. This year, growth estimates are over 5%. And this is despite, you know, all these Western media outlets claiming that the Chinese economy is in a crisis. It continues to grow, certainly, much more quickly than the U.S. economy and other Western economies. But the point is, China has the world's largest economy. However, it is true that part of that is because China is such a massive country with more than 1.4 billion people. So it has four times the U.S. population of more than 330 million people. In order to adjust for the population, you have to look at GDP per capita, which is the measurement of all of the goods and services produced in an economy divided by the population. And there you can see that China still has a lot of room for development compared to the wealthy Western countries like the United States and other European countries, although I should stress that those countries developed through colonialism, hundreds of years of colonialism, 
The Indian economist Utsa Patnaik has estimated that the British Empire siphoned out more than $45 trillion of wealth just from India when India was a British colony, not to mention the other colonies of Britain and the other European powers. So that money, that capital that was extracted from the colonies was then used to industrialize and to develop these economies. China did not develop through colonialism. And of course, China itself was a victim of colonialism, not to the same degree as India, but it was partially colonized and invaded and attacked and exploited by numerous foreign colonial powers. So China has really had to catch up economically with development. However, when we do this comparison, once again, it can obfuscate more than it clarifies. A much better comparison is not apples to oranges, but apples to apples. Rather, you should look at China's economic development compared to other countries in the global south that were colonized. So, for instance, India got independence from British colonialism in 1947, which also led to the creation of Pakistan. And China had its revolution in 1949 overthrowing this feudal regime and ending the century of humiliation. So these Global South countries came from similar levels of development in the 1940s, and China has developed significantly more rapidly than the economies of India or Pakistan or other nations. So clearly, they were doing something different. Their economic model was fundamentally different. And even as recently as the 1980s, the per capita GDP me measured a purchasing power parity of China was lower than the per capita GDP of Haiti, of Honduras, of Sudan. These are some of the poorest countries on earth. So China has gone from one of the poorest countries on earth to today having an economy that is larger than the U.S. economy. How did it do that? Well, I actually have another video in which I talk about China's unique development model of socialism with Chinese characteristics. I will link to that in the description below. I go into much greater detail. But this is where another example of where GDP sometimes obfuscates more than it clarifies. Because if you look at the United States, for instance, a lot of GDP comes from the financial sector. It comes from speculation pumping up big bubbles with asset price inflation to pump up the value of stocks and bonds and real estate. And this has led to, you know, big crises like the 2008 financial crash because of subprime mortgages and this house of cards that the banking system was built on or the 2000 dot com bubble. And then if you look at other sectors of the economy, you can see, for instance, that 18 percent of the GDP comes from healthcare spending. And yet the U.S. spends so much money on healthcare and has some of the worst results out of all of the rich industrialized countries. So just because you spend a lot of money in your economy doesn't mean that you're actually being productive with the use of those resources. And we can see this clearly with deindustrialization in the United States. China has become the factory of the world. China produces everything, as I'll be discussing today. And China today represents nearly one third of global manufacturing production, whereas the U.S. represents just over 15 percent, half of China's industrial production. The U.S. economy has financialized over time under the neoliberal economic model that rose in the 1980s. And this has led to the move toward the service sector, the move away from manufacturing. It has led to deindustrialization in significant parts of the U.S. And this has left behind impoverished areas like the Rust Belt. If you're only fixated on GDP, you can miss the forest for the trees and not see the fundamental differences in the U.S. economic model, which is based on financial speculation, pumping up bubbles of asset price inflation, and the Chinese model, which is fundamentally based on productive investment in manufacturing, in producing things that people all around the world need for their daily lives. And this brings me to the main point that I wanted to stress today, which is the issue of sovereignty. I really think living here in China and experiencing life here that you can say that China is probably the most sovereign country on earth. Why do I say that? Well, 
A lot of people in Western countries don't really think much about sovereignty because they don't have a history of their sovereignty being violated by foreign powers because the Western nations developed again economically through colonialism. They were the colonial powers that violated the sovereignty of global South nations that they colonized. So that's one way of thinking about sovereignty, which is not the best way. I'm gonna talk about another way in a second, but it is true that one way of having sovereignty like the colonial powers in the West have, is through this, this history of colonialism and violating the sovereignty of other countries, using military might to impose your own sovereignty. And this is not just ancient history. We can look at the United States today and see that, yes, the U.S. is a very sovereign country because it violates the sovereign of so many other countries and imposes its will on much of the world. The United States has meddled in countries all over planet Earth, and the U.S. has invaded many countries like Iraq and Afghanistan. It has bombed and waged war on many other countries like Vietnam and Korea and Yemen and Syria and Libya. The list goes on. The U.S. has organized coups to overthrow democratically elected governments in dozens of countries. I mean, I could spend all day discussing the foreign U.S. interventions. This is something that I do discuss a lot here at Geopolitical Economy Report. So you can go check out other videos and articles for that analysis. But the point is, China has not done that. So U.S. sovereignty is based on simply imperial power, threats of military invasions, the use of military force, economic threats, the use of sanctions, trying to cut off countries from accessing the international financial institutions like the IMF and the World Bank, like the interbank messaging system SWIFT. China doesn't do any of that. China has developed its own sovereign institutions through its own economic development. So the political and economic models are completely different. They're antithetical. So a lot of people in the West don't think about how important it is for your country to be sovereign, for it to be able to produce the food and commodities and technology that it needs to, to, to have a functioning economy. Instead, especially in the age of neoliberal globalization, so many countries are dependent on other countries. This is especially true on the global south, but it's also true for increasingly Western countries themselves. And we can see, for instance, with the supply chain shocks that happened during the pandemic, with disruption to the supply chains, people realized if you rely so much on other countries for the production of commodities that you need, then if those countries can't produce it or they decide not to produce it, you can see that it causes inflation, it causes shortages, it causes major economic problems in your own country. China has understood the importance of this and China has engaged in industrial policy and planning in a way where every single part of the global supply chain is located in China. China can basically produce almost anything that it needs to survive, that its economy needs, that it, its people need to live everyday normal lives. This is of course directly related to the issue of manufacturing and the issue, the problem in the US of deindustrialization. This is why certain US government officials, like for instance, the Biden administration's national security advisor, Jake Sullivan, gave a historic speech in which he acknowledged that neoliberal globalization had eroded U.S. supply chains and industrial production. And this is a national security threat because the U.S. can't, it simply cannot produce many things that it needs, not only for everyday life, but that its military needs. China understood this from day one. And this is why, you know, a lot of the Western attacks on China, calling it authoritarian and say, saying that it wants to censor everything and control everything, it's often misunderstanding. No, 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 no. China was always careful to try to make sure that it was sovereign, that it was protected, that it was not overly dependent on foreign countries so it could actually defend itself, its territorial integrity and its national security. So this brings me back to the idea of sovereignty and thinking about it in a different way, which is economic sovereignty. I wanna look specifically at some examples that I've seen in my experience here in China so people can understand 
What I mean when I say China is probably the most sovereign country on earth. Well, here's an example. I spent a lot of time living in and traveling in Latin America. And yet in Latin America, there are a lot of governments that have revolutionary projects challenging the neo-colonialist policies of the U.S. and the Monroe Doctrine, the long history of the U.S. meddling in their internal affairs. And they have achieved a lot in terms of defending their sovereignty, their political sovereignty, in some ways their economic sovereignty. But one way in which many countries on earth, including even countries with revolutionary governments, don't have sovereignty is technological sovereignty. What I mean by that? Well, look, for instance, at Cuba. The U.S. has tried to use social media applications, which are owned by Silicon Valley corporations, which also happen to be U.S. government contractors. Washington has long tried to use these social media platforms to destabilize Cuba, spreading propaganda, spreading fake news. This is what originally led the Cuban government to actually ban many of those applications. So in return, the U.S. government created its own Twitter alternative called Sunsuneo, which it funded and then used to spread propaganda, once again, fake news, disinformation, to try to destabilize the Cuban government. There are many examples of the Pentagon and the State Department using these social media platforms as tools, geopolitical tools, to try to destabilize foreign adversaries. And yet, in a lot of countries in Latin America and other countries on Earth, all across the planet, Everyone uses YouTube. Everyone uses Facebook. Everyone uses Instagram, which, by the way, belongs to Meta, which is the parent company of Facebook. And by the way, all across the global south, one of the most popular apps is WhatsApp. WhatsApp is also the property of Meta, the parent company of Facebook and Instagram. And Meta, of course, has billions of dollars of contracts with the U.S. government. So these Silicon Valley corporations are closely linked to the U.S. government. Washington uses them to spy on foreign countries. We know that the U.S. has even used these kinds of applications to spy on foreign heads of state, including of allies, like European allies, who are spied on by the United States. But in China, the U.S. can't do that because they don't use those apps. Instead of WhatsApp, everyone uses WeChat. That's the most common way to communicate with people. You can also use it for payment and other applications within WeChat. People don't use YouTube that much either. Instead, they use Bilibili, which is a Chinese video hosting platform. Instead of Facebook and Twitter, they have Weibo. And then, of course, you have TikTok, which is becoming very popular all around the world. Although this is a very important point that I should stress here. In China, in mainland China, TikTok is actually not the app that people use. There's a separate mainland Chinese version of the app, which is called Douyin, which is, which is a separate company from TikTok. And by the way, as the CEO of TikTok pointed out when he was being grilled in a U.S. congressional briefing, TikTok is actually based in the U.S., in California, and in Singapore, not in China. And the CEO of TikTok is Singaporean. He's not Chinese. But the point, once again, is that China has its own social media apps, and social media is just barely scratching the surface. Let's think about email. Think about how important email is, not just for average people, but for governments, for companies. Every institution, every organization needs digital communication, and so many people around the world use Gmail, which is, of course, Google. It's owned by Google, and as is often said, never forget, if a product is free in scare quotes, that's because you are the product. When we're talking about these Silicon Valley companies, the reason Gmail and all these other applications are free is because you are the product. Your data is being collected by these companies. They sell your data to advertising firms. The U.S. government uses that data itself for mass surveillance. So, you know, when Washington accuses Beijing of surveillance and all these things, it's exactly what the U.S. government has been doing, and not only on people in the U.S., but people all around the world. I, as a journalist, have organized interviews with government officials, and their, their offices have emailed me using Gmail accounts. So think about how much of a national security threat that is. These are governments, including upper levels of governments all around the world, that are using 
Google's mail service, and Google is a contractor with the CIA. Google's a contractor with the Pentagon. Google is inextricably linked to the U.S. government. In China, people don't use Google. Google, Google is blocked here. They have QQ. They have many other services that provide mail and provide many other applications. Uh, another example is Maps. So Google Maps, of course, is very popular. Well, Google Maps is blocked in China. Instead, they have their own Maps applications like Baidu. And by the way, I should point out that these US apps like Google Maps also use GPS. And GPS is not a neutral technology. GPS is the US government. GPS was created by the US military and still today, who runs, who operates, who oversees GPS? It's the US Department of Defense. GPS is part of the US government. So instead, China developed its own alternative to GPS, which is called Beidou. So China, once again, it's sovereign technologically. It doesn't need to rely on the US military to have geolocating of not only its military, but of everything else that's happening inside China and around the world. It has its own technological sovereign capacity in a way that many other countries don't have. Another example of this goes back to WeChat, which is what I mentioned. We've seen all across the world the move toward the digitization of the economy. So instead of using physical cash, more and more we're using cards. And in some countries like China, not even cards anymore, but rather QR codes and simply scanning your phone, right? And the most common apps for payment are WeChat and Alipay, not, not PayPal, not US firms. Now, there is all across the planet a move toward digitization, digital payments. So India, for instance, has a really big drive that has been pushing for people to pay with their phone using QR codes like in China. The argument made, which, you know, as an element of truth, is that there are a lot of people who are in the informal economy, many poor and working class people. They don't have bank accounts. They don't receive paychecks. So di the digitization of the economy is a way to help get them more involved in the formal economy. And it can be helpful for a lot of people, in particular in rural areas. However, if you look at a lot of the apps that are being used, there are some domestic apps. But you know one of the main competitors that's trying to take over that market? Amazon. So we see around the world in countries that are trying to develop this technology, U.S. monopolies like Amazon are trying to take over these markets and essentially colonize the, di these digital spaces. China's digital space and technological space is not colonized. China is fully sovereign. In fact, another example of this is Amazon itself. So China also has its own local firms for people to buy things online. The most popular is Taobao, which is again, a Chinese application. It's not Amazon. Now, Amazon did try to get access to the Chinese market. And you know what happened? It basically didn't really work. First of all, China requires all foreign firms like Amazon to partner with local Chinese firms and often to have equity owned by Chinese investors. So they're partially Chinese companies, once again, defending its economic sovereignty. But even beyond that, Amazon basically failed to get a significant part of the market share in China. Because once again, the technological space and the digital space in China is not colonized. And as we, I was talking about the history of colonialism, well, we also need to think not just about physical colonization, but also about economic colonization, technological colonization, digital colonization. China is sovereign in these spaces in a way that many countries are not sovereign. And as we move toward increasingly digitized economies, these discussions are going to become more and more important. And by the way, when I talk about technological sovereignty, it's not just about the software. It's also about the hardware. And so, for instance, the phones that we use these applications on, if you walk around China, the vast majority of the phones are made by Chinese firms, not foreign firms. Of course, a lot of people know about Huawei largely because the United States has been waging an economic war against Huawei, imposing sanctions, trying to prevent Huawei from developing. Huawei phones are very popular and very good phones, by the way, but it's not just Huawei. 
There are also many other great Chinese phone companies like Xiaomi, like Oppo. There are many others. And if you walk around in China, you can see them everywhere you go. And by the way, the telecommunications companies in China are state-owned. They're not run as parasitical, for-profit corporations like Verizon or AT&T. These big corporate monopolies or oligopolies like Verizon or AT&T that control so much of the market that, first of all, they charge ex exorbitant prices. It's just extortion. I mean, the bills that people pay for just basic phone data f from these U.S. companies are absurd. I mean, here in China, people pay a few dollars every month for significantly more data because this is a public good. The Chinese government understands that telecommunications is a public good. It's not run for profit. These are state-owned companies like China Telecom and others, and they provide this as a public service for their country, along with the construction companies are largely state-owned. The transportation grid is largely state-owned. All of the big banks are state-owned because these are public goods. They're not run by these small handfuls of corporate oligopolies or monopolies that use it to extract rent, just rent-seeking. It's not actually engaged in production and helping to grow the economy productively. Instead, these U.S. monopolies they simply want to extract more rent and make more and more profits. And at the end of the day, it actually makes the economy less productive. But anyway, the point is, it's not just the phones that, I'm, that we're talking about. It's also computers, for instance. You know what the world's largest computer company is? It's Lenovo, which is a Chinese company. And again, China is technologically sovereign when it comes to computers. And then cars, another important example. China, thanks to state planning, Thanks to industrial policy, China, the Chinese government decided that it wanted to target certain strategic sectors and make significant strides in car manufacturing, in particular manufacturing of electric vehicles, was one of them. And in just three years, China has become the world's top exporter of cars, and in particular electric vehicles. And if you go around China, especially in big cities like Beijing, where I am, you can see that there are a lot of charging stations. I mean, it's incredible how much more advanced China is in terms of infrastructure than even a lot of Western countries. On many street corners, you can find car charging stations, not only for, for cars, but also for, for instance, motorcycles and motorbikes and these kinds of things. And these are made largely by Chinese companies like BYD, which is becoming a huge producer of electric vehicles. And it's gonna be a name that's gonna be known all around the world. By the way, in terms of using those cars, if you want to get a cab, get a taxi, it, the app you use is not Uber. It's not Lyft. Now, Uber is used in a lot of countries. And of course, Uber is yet another U.S. corporation. But in China, they have their own version, which is Didi and other applications. So once again, this is another example of that technological sovereignty. And by the way, I should point out that even a lot of the foreign firms that produce cars in China, like for instance, Volkswagen, they're still produced in China. The supply chain is in China. And what's funny is you'll see, you know, Volkswagen cars that have the Volkswagen symbol, but they have Chinese text written on them or BMW cars with the Chinese text on them. So again, that's because China has developed these policies where they don't simply just welcome in all foreign direct investment without any conditions. They require joint partnerships. They require local equity stakes. I mean, they have thought about industrial policy in a way that has made them more technologically sovereign, helped them develop the supply chain at every level. And now China is not simply reliant on foreign corporations to, one, to simply survive economically, but also, two, to advance technologically. And this, by the way, precisely explains why U.S. sanctions have not been successful, because the U.S. sanctions have essentially made China even more technologically sovereign. Semiconductors are a great example of this. The U.S. government imposed sanctions on China, on Chinese firms and institutions, trying to prevent China from developing advanced semiconductor technology, banning firms around the world from exporting advanced semiconductors, advanced chips, or quantum computing parts, or AI technology,
or they face the threat of U.S. sanctions or U.S. secondary sanctions. But what has happened? This has not worked. In just a few years, Huawei has made enormous technological strides, and the newest Huawei phone, the Mate 60 Pro, has 7 nanometer chips. Now, the U.S. sanctions targeting Huawei and other firms were trying to prevent China from developing chips that were 14 nanometers or smaller. Well, China is already developing seven nanometer chips. And again, why is this? It's because of the technological sovereignty that it has. The US imposed sanctions to try to prevent China from getting access to advanced semiconductors. So what happened? Well, China has a state-owned semiconductor company, which is called SMIC, Semiconductor Manufacturing International Corporation. And what happened? This state-owned company developed the technology and gave it to Huawei, a Chinese firm. And now, by the way, the U.S. is claiming, absurdly, that China is violating sanctions because a Chinese state-owned company, SMIC, gave technology to a Chinese phone company, Huawei. So China is trading with China, which violates sanctions, according to the U.S. I mean, this is, again, this madness is exactly why China has prioritized being technologically sovereign, why it's so important. It's not only a matter of economic development, it's a matter of national security. Now, a lot of Westerners will criticize the Chinese government for censoring social media, but in reality, what, when China blocks Western social media applications, what you should really think about this is not censorship, it's actually basically a kind of tariff. What do I mean by that? Well, China developed its own technological alternatives, and then by blocking the Western Silicon Valley corporations, China encouraged people in the country to use applications like WeChat, Weibo, Bilibili. That doesn't mean that it's illegal to use Western social media, or when we say Western social media, we mean U.S. social media platforms, because where are the European social media platforms? Europe is just as dependent on the U.S. for these social media companies. So it's not illegal to use YouTube in China. Obviously, I mean, I'm using it right now. I mean, CGTN, the Chinese state media outlet, uses YouTube. It's not illegal in China to use Twitter. I mean, Chinese government officials use Twitter. So instead, it's blocked, but a lot of people use VPNs. It's very common in China. It's not illegal. It's not about censorship. It's about protectionism. So this is basically a form of economic protectionism, like a tariff. What is the idea behind a tariff? Well, if a country wants to develop its own local industry, it will impose tariffs on foreign competitors in order to encourage the creation of local infant industries. So, so eventually they can get to a point where they're competitive enough in international markets, and then the government can lift those tariffs and the local industry will not be simply destroyed and cannibalized by foreign competition. Tariffs are a way that countries all around the world have used to develop local industries. By the way, not just China. The Western powers all use tariffs to develop their economy. The South Korean development economist Ha Jun Chang showed this in his book, Kicking Away the Ladder. They had protectionist models in the U.S., in multiple European economies, in order to develop their own local infant industries. And eventually, when those industries were competitive enough and large enough that they wouldn't be devoured by foreign competitors, then the governments lifted tariffs. And that prevented their local industries from being cannibalized and then those countries becoming economically dependent on foreign firms. This is exactly how the Western economies developed, and yet they tell countries all around the world to lift their tariffs, to end their protectionist policies. Well, China is actually doing what they, rich economies, did, and not only in the form of tariffs, which, I mean, you know, tariffs are hundreds of years old. This is not a new idea for economic development. So China applied the same idea of a tariff, but not just for the creation of tangible physical industries, but also for digital infrastructure, for social media platforms, for software applications. So it's not just about censorship and control. It's about China protecting its local industries so it can become technologically sovereign in a way that other countries are not.
Now, we know that the U.S. government can clearly see how important the issue of technological sovereignty is because there's been this hysterical drive in the U.S. to ban TikTok. Many U.S. politicians are calling to ban TikTok, and they claim this is a matter of national security and all of that, but it's also simply a way of preventing Chinese firms from competing with U.S. monopolies like Meta, like YouTube, which is owned by Google. So this is another form of economic protectionism. So the U.S. once again is criticizing China for its protectionist policies, but the U.S. is engaging in those very same policies. It's deeply hypocritical. And of course, the U.S. Commerce Secretary, Gina Raimundo, said publicly that Washington's goal is to prevent China from developing and innovating technologically. That is an actual quote from a top U.S. government official. We don't want China to innovate more than we do. So they don't want competition. So ironically, the U.S. sanctions on China, which are increasingly aggressive, targeting many different companies in China and different sectors of the economy, different industries, they ironically have the impact of basically functioning as tariffs. And in the long run, the medium to the long run, this is actually making China even more technologically sovereign. It's not dependent on U.S. companies. Instead of depending on foreign semiconductor technology, China's developing it itself. So this all gets back to the point I was saying earlier about protectionism. You know, this, this, this Western propaganda narrative saying that the Chinese government just wants to control everything and it's totalitarian, they wanna censor everything. No, by blocking Western social media platforms, it's a form of protectionism. And it's a way of defending its technological and economic sovereignty in a way that's been very successful, in a way that no other country on earth has been able to replicate. To such a degree that U.S. Silicon Valley big tech corporations have colonized the digital and technological space of economies in, the, I would say, the majority of the world. So when I go into all this detail about the importance of sovereignty and why I think China is the most sovereign country on earth, this isn't to say that China is perfect. Obviously, there are problems. And for instance, the Chinese government has acknowledged that it has problems economically. I can think of two really big ones right now. First of all, China is still very much dependent on energy, on importing energy. And China is also, to, to a lesser extent, dependent on importing food. I'll start with energy. China does still import a lot of fossil fuels, especially oil, especially gas. And, you know, China actually is, this isn't that well known, it is one of the world's top 10 producers of oil and gas, but that's mostly because it's such a huge country. It does not produce enough oil and gas to meet all its needs. It is heavily dependent on importing fossil fuels. And that explains why China, for instance, has been trying to maintain very positive relations with countries in West Asia, like in the Persian Gulf region, countries like Saudi Arabia and the UAE, which have historically been very close U.S. allies. But actually, in the past decade, they've be China has become their top trading partner. And at the same time, of course, China also has very close relations with Iran, another significant exporter of oil and gas. Of course, China and Russia have become very close allies, and Russia is another major producer of oil and gas. So that is a way of maintaining its energy stability in China. And especially as it grows economically, it needs more and more energy. So this is not only a question of economic stability, it's simply a question of national security. But China also understands the incredible importance of transitioning away from fossil fuels. One, because it is so dependent on importing fossil fuels, but also even more important because of climate change. China takes the threat of climate change very seriously, much more seriously than many Western politicians, especially in the U.S., where there are still so many U.S. politicians who are climate science deniers. I mean, they have their heads in the sand like an ostrich. It's completely catastrophic, considering that the U.S. historically, and still today, is the largest per capita emitter of carbon and is destroying the planet. China, on the other hand, is going through a revolutionary transition toward renewable energy. China alone is responsible for more than 80% of all of the world's investment in 
renewable energy manufacturing, China is leading the world in the production and installation of solar panels and wind turbines. In fact, China already has more photovoltaic power, that is PV power capacity, than the following countries combined, the United States, Japan, India, Germany, Australia, Spain, and South Korea. In 2022, 44% of all of the new electricity capacity installed in China was solar panel capacity. And this year, 2023, China is on the path to install more solar panel capacity than the U.S. has ever installed in its entire history. So China understands the grave threat of climate change. It's taking it very seriously. It is leading the world in the green transition. And this also is a matter of national security for China. And, and once again, it makes it more sovereign. So it's not so dependent on foreign energy. Now, another weakness in China is the issue of food sovereignty. And Beijing has understood the supreme importance of food sovereignty. And in recent decades, the Chinese government has invested huge sums of money in increasing the capacity of local food production. As the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations pointed out, quote, China has succeeded in producing one fourth of the world's grain and feeding one fifth of the world's population with less than 10 percent of the world's arable land, which is a great achievement in pursuit of food and nutrition security, not only in China, but also in the world. Currently, China ranks first in the world in terms of the production of cereals, cotton, fruit, vegetables, meat, poultry, eggs, and fishery products. However, that said, China is still the world's largest food importer. I mean, again, it's feeding 1.4 billion people. So that's a lot of malice to feed, but that is another weakness in terms of its potential national security. And China has been trying to increase its food sovereignty. I actually published an article about this over at geopoliticaleconomy.com looking at China's state-funded agricultural cooperative program and how it's using co-ops to try to increase agricultural production and strengthen food security. For people who are interested in that, I will link to that article in the description below. But the point I'm getting at here is that China recognizes that there are weaknesses and it's trying to strengthen its sovereignty even more in some of these key areas, especially now as it's in a moment of economic transition. And you've probably seen there has been a lot of hyperbolic reporting in the Western media claiming that the Chinese economic model is in a crisis and China is going to collapse and all of that nonsense. I mean, this is the same kind of propaganda we've heard for decades with so-called China experts in the West like Gordon Cheng, who have claimed for decades, for 20 years now, that China is on the verge of collapsing. Obviously, that's not true. It's ridiculous. But there are some problems in China and economists in China are working on solving these issues. Like, for instance, there is a growing problem of debt, indebtedness, especially for local governments. Although I should point out that this is debt that, one, is owed largely to state-owned banks in China. It's not like the banks in the United States, which are all private, for-profit commercial banks in China. The biggest banks are all state owned and they are run in national interest, the interest of people. And if they really needed to write down a lot of this debt, they could. And furthermore, this debt, this government debt is owed in renminbi, in the Chinese yuan. It's not owed in dollars. It's not owed in a foreign currency. So it's much easier for China to deal with this issue of rising debt than, for instance, a country like Argentina or Egypt which is trapped in debt that is owed in dollars in a foreign currency. And the Argentine Central Bank can't print dollars. The Egyptian Central Bank, the Central Bank of Ghana or Sri Lanka, they can't print dollars in order to pay off this foreign currency denominated debt. So yes, there are some problems that economists in China are trying to grapple with, but they are actually dealing with these issues. Another big issue that people talk about a lot, and it's something that you can physically see, is inequality. There absolutely is inequality in China, and the Chinese government has prioritized the fight against inequality. Well, first, the Chinese government's goal was to lift 
hundreds of millions of people out of extreme poverty. And the Chinese government did succeed in helping to lift more than 800 million people out of extreme poverty, ending extreme poverty in the country. So now the Communist Party of China has emphasized that its new primary goal is combating inequality. And at the 19th National Congress of the Communist Party of China in 2017, the party officially changed its policy saying that previously its top priority was developing the productive forces of the Chinese economy, expanding its manufacturing capabilities, expanding infrastructure development. And now, as of 2017, its top priority is fighting inequality and uneven development within China and encouraging what the Chinese government refers to as common prosperity. So now that absolute poverty has been ended, now that the infrastructure is incredible, now the goal is to make sure that Chinese working people have much better standards of living and there is better equality between them. These are all things that governments should do for their people. And yet many Western governments, after decades of the neoliberal capitalist model, are captive. They're controlled by wealthy oligarchs, by large corporations and financial interests. They fund politicians and make sure that politicians win elections, especially in the U.S. where bribery is essentially legal because the Supreme Court and Citizens United said that political contributions, donations, are free speech. So rich people can basically buy elections. And more than 90% of the candidates running for Congress who have more funding win the elections. Meanwhile, lobbying, which is considered corruption in most countries, is completely legal in these Western governments, especially in Washington. So again, you have a government that is completely controlled by large corporations, by the rich, by the 1%. This is why it's not surprising that a majority of Chinese people, when they're actually surveyed, say they consider their government to be democratic. It's not the same kind of democracy in the Western capitalist countries, which is really a plutocracy, but it is a different kind of democracy, which the Chinese government refers to as whole process people's democracy. And it's why, ironically, a Western government backed organization closely linked to NATO, which is called the Alliance of Democracies, carried out a poll in 2022 called the Democracy Perception Index. And it found that 83% of people in China consider their government to be a democracy. And by the way, 77% of people in Vietnam consider their government to be a democracy compared to the U.S. where only 49% of people consider their government to be a democracy. So less than half the population. And in France, even fewer, 47% of people consider their government to be democratic. If you think about all the things that I've discussed today about sovereignty, about defending the national interest and doing what's best for the actual people, the working people of the country and not big corporations and foreign corporations, you can see why these results make sense. By the way, if you also see how safe China is, it makes sense. I mean, this is the safest country I've ever been in. It's incredible. People go out and party and drink at night and, you know, young women can walk home at 3 a.m., completely safe. They're not, they're not worried at all. I've heard from women here who say that they're so grateful because they've traveled to other countries and they have not felt the sense of security. I mean, these are intangible things that aren't included in GDP measurements, but they're extremely important to understand the quality of life in countries like China that are so demonized by the West. And it's very important to understand that. And that's what I'm trying to do by living here in China, studying China, learning more about China, and trying to communicate that to largely Western audiences. Because, of course, the mainstream corporate media is not going to do it. Unfortunately, they've shown again and again and again that they're simply going to collaborate with Western governments. They're not going to bite the hand that feeds them their scoops, and they're going to continue to manufacture consent for more and more aggressive policies against China in this new Cold War. Now, there is one other important point that I want to stress here before I conclude, and that is that we should not confuse China's sovereignty with isolationism. China does not want to close itself off to the rest of the world. And in fact, if you listen to the speeches of Chinese government officials, 
And if you look at government policy, economic policy, you can see that China is still very much interested in international trade. I mean, especially considering that, yes, China is sovereign in all these ways, but China also maintains a chronic current account surplus. It has a trade surplus with the rest of the world, exporting significantly more than it imports. In fact, this issue has led to a big debate about the future of the Chinese economy. There are economists who say that China should stop emphasizing the importance of exports and transition its model more toward internal consumption, increasing local demand, and have more of a service sector-based economy. And there are indications that China will, will probably move in that direction somewhat, although Chinese officials are very concerned. They don't want to get stuck in the infamous middle-income trap. They don't want to repeat the mistakes of Japan and get trapped in decades of economic stagnation. They still want to make sure that production is the basis of their economy. They don't want to financialize like the Western neoliberal economies. They don't want to de-industrialize and repeat those same problems. So this is why Chinese officials have been hesitant about adopting the advice of economists who say that instead it should prioritize boosting local demand, local consumption. It's in a complicated situation because by keeping the yuan undervalued, it makes Chinese exports much more competitive. But at the same time, that also it reduces local demand. So if it wants to have a more consumer oriented economy, it will likely have to increase the value of the yuan, which could potentially lead to more and more imports, which could reduce China's trade surplus with the rest of the world. But then exports would become less competitive because its currency would become more and more valued. So China doesn't want to destroy its industrial sector, its production. This issue has led to a big debate about the future of the Chinese economy. There are a lot of economists who argue that the Chinese renminbi, the currency, the yuan, the yuan is the unit of account, the renminbi is the official name, that it's very undervalued. And I think actually it's true. The currency is very much undervalued because things are very cheap here in China if you have access to a foreign currency like dollars, for instance. And a lot of that is because so much is produced domestically. Food is very cheap. Even technology, technological products are very cheap because they're produced here. You don't have to pay extra for the cost of transportation for imports because it's all produced in the country. This means that basically everything in China is extremely cheap except for imported goods and real estate. Real estate is still very expensive, but by the way, that's why the government has burst the bubble, the real estate bubble. This is an important point to stress. There's a lot of reporting in the Western media, very hyperbolic reporting, claiming that the Chinese real estate sector is collapsing and this is going to cause the economy to collapse. What they don't point out is that this is partially intentional government policy. Beijing made the intentional decision not to bail out big real estate giants like Evergrande, which probably would have been bailed out in you know the Western neoliberal countries. Instead, President Xi said... Housing is for living in. It's not for speculation. Around 90% of people in China own the houses that they live in. And by the way, this is one of the highest rates in the world. And you know other countries that have some of the highest rates of home ownership in the entire world? Vietnam, Cuba, Laos, other countries that have socialist governments. They have encouraged a policy in which almost everyone owns the houses that they live in. The Chinese government did not want so much of its economy to be based on speculation in this big real estate bubble like the Western neoliberal economies, like the U.S. economy, which is based on financial speculation. By bursting this bubble intentionally, this is the Chinese government saying that they're moving toward slowly transitioning toward a new economic model that's not interested in this form of you know, real estate speculation, this bubble. Instead, it's looking toward sectors like advanced industrial production in high technology, high tech sectors, like, for instance, renewable energy, like semiconductors and phones and computers and electric vehicles. China has become the world's largest car manufacturer exporting more cars even than Japan and Germany, which had been the world's you know, car superpowers. China is becoming a new 
high tech superpower. It's no longer producing the very low value added technological products that that China was known for for many decades. I mean, when I was growing up, you know, in the 1990s, there were all these stereotypes about China and these products being made in China, which meant, you know, they were bad quality products. They were very, you know, cheap little toys and stuff. I mean, today, China is at the cutting edge of technological production. And the Chinese government can see very clearly that is the future of its economy. But with all of that said, this leads me back to the issue of trade. I want to stress that China is not interested in isolationism. It's not trying to block itself off from the rest of the world. China still very much is interested in international trade. But I think this gets back to a fundamental flaw in the way that many economists around the world think about international trade. And this goes back to the idea of comparative advantage, which was developed by the political economist David Ricardo back in the early 19th century. If you take a macroeconomics 101 class, you will learn about comparative advantage. And, you know, there is an element of truth in it, of course. And it essentially says that countries should not prioritize economic production in sectors where they could instead invest those resources and that energy and labor and capital in higher value added industries. So as a very basic example, if in your country you have a lot of people trained as engineers, you have invested a lot in human capital, you should instead, you should create computers and phones and cars and they should, those engineers should not be, you know, sewing cloth to make clothes, right? The classical example that David Ricardo used back in the early 19th century was with England and Portugal with the production of cloth and wine. And the argument was that Portugal had a, an absolute advantage in producing both wine and cloth. That is to say, it could produce more wine and cloth than England, but it would be in Portugal's comparative advantage to instead produce wine and England should instead produce cloth because England had a comparative advantage in producing cloth. And David Ricardo, being a classical political economist, he saw all value as coming from labor. And of course, the neoclassical economists who came, you know, several decades later would, would turn this all in its head. Instead, they said that value comes from essentially pleasure, from utility, which is much harder to measure, right? But David Ricardo is measuring things in terms of the amount of hours of labor that are needed in order to produce these products. And he said that, you know, it makes sense if Portugal and England trade, they will become wealthier and more prosperous if Portugal instead produces according to its comparative advantage and produces wine and Britain, England produces according to its comparative advantage and produces cloth and then they trade with each other. Now, this argument is true. And of course, comparative advantage can be very important. However, there are several ma major problems with David Ricardo's conception of comparative advantage. First of all, it assumes that capital cannot move and labor cannot move between these countries. And we can see in the era of outsourcing in particular and with new technologies, capital is very easy to move. In fact, capital moves more easily than human beings in many cases, but even it's also easier for human beings to move with new technologies, despite, you know, restrictions on immigration and all of that. Another problem with this idea, which, with, which is a problem with many of these thought experiments in economics, is which they assume perfect competition. And the reality is that we have, you know, a world with these big corporate monopolies and oligopolies, you know, like Monsanto and big tech corporations and all of that on Silicon Valley. So, I mean, there very much is not perfect competition. And many of these firms are interested in destroying any competition they have around the world. You can see this with the way, you know, that Uber used the low interest rates in the U.S., and very cheap loans. And basically Uber never really made any money, but it became a monopoly by eating up all of the market share by offering taxis that were cheaper than all of the local taxis. So they put all of the local taxis out of business. And then when Uber established a monopoly, it hiked up prices. So that's the, the profit model of many of these companies. They rely on low interest rates, quantitative easing, this big bubble, all this liquidity and they get really cheap loans. They're not profitable. This is what Amazon did as well. They destroy all of their competition. And then when they're the monopoly power, they 
establish monopoly rent. And it's all about rent extraction once again. So the actual political economy of the world today is completely different from what David Ricardo was talking about in the early 19th century. Furthermore, this idea of comparative advantage, this model assumes that the different states are completely sovereign and that they can have actually fair trade agreements between them. Whereas, you know, we have colonialism and neocolonialism and imperialism. And frequently what we see is that the wealthy countries with big economies impose unfair trade agreements on poor countries and developing countries. So even the whole idea of comparative advantage is not really that relevant because we're not talking about rational, perfectly competitive economies. We're talking about unequal trade agreements imposed by these monopolized and oligopolized industries. Then there's the critique that comes from the Indian economists Prabhat Patnaik and Utsa Patnaik, who pointed out that even this classical example of Portugal producing wine and cloth and England producing wine and cloth, it assumes that England can produce wine or that these, that these countries can produce the same commodities that are produced in the global south. As the Potniks have pointed out, if you go to the tropical climates, there are often harvests two or three times a year, whereas in the temperate climates in Europe, there are harvests only one time a year. So they simply cannot produce things like, how are you going to grow bananas in England? Good luck growing mangoes in England. So even this whole idea is, of course, it, it breaks down as well, and their analysis is much deeper. Their analysis is, is about how imperialism is about depressing the wages of workers in the global south that produce these commodities. And that's, an, that's a point I'm going to come back to in a second, because that's fundamentally getting at my significant critique, my main critique of the Ricardian idea of comparative advantage. But there's another significant critique, which is the idea of national security. Now, of course, if you're talking about things like wine and cloth, okay, that's not that important. You, you don't need wine to survive. If a country blocks you from importing their wine, okay, whatever. You might, you, some winos might be angry, but your economy is still going to be fine. But if we're talking about comparative advantage with things like the production of food, with things like the production of energy, with things like the production of certain electronics like semiconductors that you need to power your economy, then it's not simply a matter of comparative advantage and what makes you more prosperous and wealthier. I mean, another clear example is that according to classical comparative advantage theory, it does not make sense for the U.S. to be one of the world's largest agricultural exporters. It would be in the U.S. comparative advantage to focus on other industries like technological production. And yet every single year, the U.S. exports hundreds of billions of dollars of agricultural products because Washington recognizes, one, that it needs food security. This is a national security issue, not just a question of maximizing utility and, and wealth. But furthermore, because the U.S. government also spends many billions of dollars subsidizing agriculture, subsidizing these big ag corporations, these monopolies and oligopolies that dominate the industry, and then they use food exports as a political weapon to make other countries like Haiti, for instance, dependent on U.S. food exports after destroying local agricultural capacity in poor countries like Haiti. So again, just looking at everything in terms of comparative advantage ignores many other significant factors. If you're Venezuela, for instance, it was in your comparative advantage to simply produce oil and export that oil to the United States and then import food and technology from the United States. That's what Venezuela did for 100 years. But what happened? The people of Venezuela elected a socialist who nationalized the oil reserves and used that oil wealth to benefit the people of Venezuela. And the U.S. didn't like that government. And U.S. corporations like ExxonMobil wanted to get access to Venezuela. They had been kicked out of Venezuela. Their investments had been nationalized by the Venezuelan government. So what happened? The U.S. imposed sanctions on Venezuela and a blockade on Venezuela and prevented Venezuela from being able to export its oil, which starved the government of revenue. The government lost 99% of its revenue. It couldn't export its oil. It couldn't invest in further oil production. It couldn't even keep up oil production at a constant level because it couldn't import the technology, the technological products it needed, the capital goods that it needed to maintain its oil production. So you saw economic crisis. So 
it was in Venezuela's comparative advantage to simply become dependent on importing food and technology. So this is the other fundamental problem with comparative advantage. It doesn't consider the issue of dependency. It traps countries in cycles of dependency. It says it's in the comparative advantage of the United States to export jets, jet engines, and weapons, and missiles, and TVs, and computers. Actually, those aren't even produced in the U.S. anymore. But the idea is, okay, well, it's in the U.S. comparative advantage to export these high-value-added technological products, and it's in the comparative advantage of Honduras to keep exporting T-shirts and basic low-value-added textile products to the U.S. Well, how is Honduras going to develop its technological capabilities if it just simply always acts in its comparative advantage? How is Bolivia going to develop its own local industry if all it does is export raw, unprocessed lithium? How are Chile and Peru going to develop their local industry if they simply rely on exporting raw, unprocessed copper, copper ore? I mean, this idea that it's in their comparative advantage to, to forever be colonial appendages of the colonial powers. So the colonial powers export high value added products and the colonized countries that are supposedly independent, you know, politically, but economically, there's this neo-colonial cycle of dependency. If, if it's in their comparative advantage to only be resource extraction hubs, how are they ever going to get out of this cycle of neo-colonial dependency? They have to be able to develop their own local industry. That requires protectionist policies. That requires investment in their own local industries where they may not have a comparative advantage now, but they could potentially have a comparative advantage in the future if they can build up their infant industries through tariffs, through state subsidies, through investment in infrastructure and research and development. These are all the things that China did. Now, if China had simply listened to all of the neoliberal economists and who told them, it, China, it's in your comparative advantage to simply only produce toys for McDonald's Happy Meals and only produce t-shirts and only produce cheap, low value added technologies, then China never would have become the high value added technological exporter that it is now. So at every level, at every stage, these policies that China has carried out of protecting its economy, protecting its its technological sectors. These are all policies that China has used to, to become more sovereign so that now it is in China's comparative advantage to produce many of these products and it's no longer in China's comparative advantage to instead waste the human capital that it's developed on producing textiles when, they can, when these engineers can make Huawei phones. So China has been able to get out of this trap that so many formerly colonized poor countries are stuck in. And that's exactly what I'm interested in studying and learning more about and reporting on here at Geopolitical Economy Report. Policies like, for instance, the Chinese government required foreign firms that were investing in China to have joint partnerships with local firms and to have local equity ownership. China also, for instance, required technology transfer. And this is Re frequently referred to in the West as so-called forced technology transfer. But as legal scholars in the West have pointed out, this is not forced technology transfer. The foreign companies that invested in China wanting to get access to cheap Chinese labor, getting access to the highly skilled Chinese workers, getting access to all these parts of the supply chain located in China, all of the resources and that, that make it easier and cheaper for products to be to be produced all in China. The companies that invested, the foreign firms that invested in China, they knew that one of the conditions of their investment was they had to share technology. They had to partner with local firms. They did so voluntarily. So it's not forced, it's voluntary technology transfer. And China used these policies to move up the supply chain of production. And now China is at the highest levels of industrial production, and China is responsible for nearly one third of global manufacturing production compared to 15% for the US.
So these are all things that I'm going to be exploring more in the future here at Geopolitical Economy Report. I wanted to talk about them today because I wanted to reflect on my experience living in China, but also re researching China a lot. Now, I'm not an expert on China. I'm trying to learn much more. And as I learn, I'm going to share my knowledge more and more with all of you. I don't speak fluent Chinese, so there is a language barrier. I'm trying to learn more Chinese, but it's very difficult. But this is why I'm here. Of course, today, this was very, very long. I think this is probably my longest video. But I wanted to reflect on the things that I've been thinking about a lot here as I've been living in China. I'm going to be thinking about them a lot more, researching them a lot more, doing more and reporting on them in the future. Why do I think this is also important? Well, I think there's so much that we can learn from China and its unique economic model. Now, of course, there are a lot of differences, of course, that cannot be applied in other countries. Like, for instance, the fact that China has 1.4 billion people, it is such a massive country that gives it some advantages that other countries can't have. But equally, I should point out, it also gives China some disadvantages. So the point is that I think there are a lot of lessons that we can take from learning about China lessons especially for a lot of developing countries in the global south but even lessons for the rich industrialized countries in the west so i am going to wrap up here i want to thank everyone man if you join me to the end here you really are a trooper i want to thank you for listening the entire way through and i want to remind everyone to please subscribe on whatever platform you're watching or listening on if you're on youtube please like the video, please subscribe to our channel. It helps to promote our material in the algorithm. If you're listening to a podcast version of this, please subscribe as well. Of course, for people watching, if you don't know, every video is also available as a podcast and vice versa. And for people who want to support the work that we do, please consider going to geopoliticaleconomy.com slash support. There are a few ways you can donate. The best is you can go to patreon.com slash geopoliticaleconomy and become a patron. We are completely independent. We have no institutional support. We have no big donors. We rely entirely on small donors from viewers and listeners like you. We are, again, are totally independent. I'm an independent journalist. I'm living in China, yes, but I am doing my own work. I'm not being told what to do. I'm not being told what to think. I want to thank everyone who has supported our work here at Geopolitical Economy Report. As I said at the beginning, I'm not changing the direction of this channel. Not all of my videos in the future are going to be about China and all of this. I mean, this is going to be, an, of course, an important point of my work, but I'm going to continue discussing geopolitics, economics, Latin America, Africa, Europe, the U.S., I mean, other parts of Asia. This is not just all going to be a China-focused channel, but of course, China plays such an important role in the rapidly evolving geopolitical and economic order. So, of course, it's going to be a big part of my reporting and analysis here. So with that said, I really am going to conclude here. I want to thank everyone once again for joining me, and I'll see you next time.